Testing one, two, three. This will be the October 1st, 2014 workshop meeting, special meeting, and regular city council meeting. Good evening. I'd like to call the order of City Council Workshop, City Satellite Beach, October 1st, 2014, approximately 6.30. And this is to interview boards for board applicants. Um, first on our list, David Bigelotti. Is that close enough? Dave, right there at that microphone. Um, first, thank you for coming the other night to uh, the program we did on you know, resilience. Well, thank you very much. I actually thought it was... Uh, Something wonderful for us to do. Um, a workshop is incredible for people like me. I would not have seen it for that sign. I'm very internet savvy, but sometimes I don't see things. Sometimes I go surfing all the time. I just want to set things up at workshops. So thank well, you thank you very much. This is very informal. The way the proceedings will work to tell everybody here is we'll do the interviews. It's an agenda item. You're welcome to stay. Okay. Um, it's towards the end of our agenda that we just take a vote on that positions okay okay um tell us a little bit about yourself and um and speak you got to speak into, into the, the mic if you would please my name is david vigliotti i have just recently moved back to my hometown grew up here um i am a montessorian ams certified and trained i teach infant toddlers into primary age so infant infants through six years of age i own a school as well it's called montessori mount pleasant in Charleston, South Carolina for the last 15 years. Um, currently, I'm going back and forth um, right now. Um, I also, um, I'm a master naturalist, so I love to go out in nature. That's why I teach ecology to young children. Uh, there's a wonderful book out there called Last Child in the Woods. Um, it's called by Richard Love, and um, I follow that. And what it means is that you have to go out there to build a relationship with the earth to understand it, to feel and appreciate it, to love it like your mother, like the Native Americans did. If you love her, you're going to protect her. And that's what I teach children. And um, it's not how many mountains you know, it's the mountain th that you're on. That's how well you know the mountain. That's about it. Thank you. Questions Something for David, who'd like to start? Um, have you been out to Samson's Island? Yes, I have, several times with my children, my family, on kayaks. And uh, you know Carrie Stoms, our recreation director? I just met her. Okay. Um, have you ever been out to the island with any of the uh, planned activities with the Samson's Island uh, Committee? I have not, but I did see on Facebook um, last weekend they did have an eradication of the um, invasive plants, which is the uh, Chinese tallow, the pepper tree, um, I did not make it. I was on a cruise with my brothers called the Brothers Cruise. So I wasn't available. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry. It's all right. Um, <clears throat> you are aware that this uh, committee is a working uh, group. They don't just sit and plan. They actually go onto the island and get their hands wet. Or dirty. Or what do they do on the earth? Dirty. <laughs> That's what I want to do. I, I, like I said, I teach children um, ecology every single day for the last 15 years. I put rubber boots on and I get extremely dirty and go out there and we go in the pluff mud and dig in the dirt. So I'm all about it. I just dressed up today. <laughs> okay. And uh, you indicated that um, you travel back and forth to South Carolina. And you're still doing that? That is correct. Will you be able to make the meetings? When are, are the meetings? <clears throat> Karen. Uh, third Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Third Tuesday. In the evening. Third Tuesday would be no problem. I generally go up there once a month for a week at a time. Okay. And it won't it won't be the third week it won't be the week that has the same. <laughs> the Samson's Island Committee meeting. No. Sure. Okay. All right. Those are all the questions I have. I really appreciate your background, your interest, your enthusiasm, and I think thank you. you'd make a good addition. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, David, well, you know, thank you for your interest to start out with. I mean, I've, I've been the liaison for that board. Carrie does a great job with that. Um, they're always looking for new ideas and opportunities to try to improve that island. So, you know, your kind of involvement with what you've got would be a good fit for that. Um, mm -hmm. 
Do you see any? Do you see anything that you personally think should be improved on the island? I mean, any, anything that jumps out at you? That's always a question I like to ask. Things that should be approved? Yeah. What What are your ideas for improving, or maybe not improving, or changing, or just what are your thoughts on what needs to be done out there? Well, I think we need to follow the three rules or guidelines that they have talked about, which is to keep, you know, excessive areas, which is docks and things like that, and restrooms and um, provide homes and plants and native species for the island itself and food. And I think it just needs to be more accessible, maybe somehow to more people, uh, maybe more marketing. I know I did see a Facebook on there. And if you look up um, any of my work, I'm also, I forgot to mention that I am a professional photographer. <laughs> uh, but you could go to David Vigliotti um, on Vimeo. Um, or Little Learner's Lodge on Vimeo, and that's me, Dave Vigliotti, and you can look at uh, all these photographs, and, and also our school, which is Little Learner's Lodge, and MMP School on Little Learn on Facebook. And if you go on Facebook, you can attract a ton of people. People are looking to that medium right now. Um, social media is huge, and if we can promote that um, to get people out there, because I think it is critical that we get people to that island. It's our island. It's we're stewards to that island. We're keepers of that island, to the uh, protectors that who gave half of that island. Um, I believe in people like that and to protect it for them. And so for me to do something on that, the question that you asked, um, I think is getting children out there. I think that's that's the key. We need to really educate how important and how critical. Um, those estuaries are because if when you get children out there to touch and feel, they love it. Believe me, when you go out there, when you can go down those paths and just run, you don't have to walk. There's no walking feet here. You can run and be wild. It's fun to be wild. So get kids out there, schools, high schools, uh, volunteer. They need to volunteer. Well, satellite high school is right there. You can throw a rock to the island. Um, they can volunteer out there. And I think that could be a, a good program for them to have a mini junior master naturalist program that they, we can get them out there and do work out there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. David, I, I think it's great that you're interested in doing this, and your background definitely leads you into this arena. You know, um, logistically, we have had some issues trying to get people out there. I mean, we, um, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck. We don't really have where the boat is that goes out there. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of parking for people to be able to park to get on the boat. So that creates some different logistics for us. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, however you guys can come up with some solution for us, we'd be more than willing to listen because what you're talking about has been something that we know exists. We need to get people out there. We need to get kids out there. We just need to figure out how to get them out there. How yeah, it adds like value to satellite beach florida this is one of our attractions that not that many people are using great okay david thank you very much um again the procedure is it's like agenda item eight or nine down here tonight and we'll make appointments on our on our regular meeting on our regular meeting okay it starts at seven okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much very much thank you okay uh i think you had one on your desk yes another one to the right uh, Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Charlie, come up here, please. Thank you. I met Charlie a few weeks ago and uh, went to Charlie's house and had my sign there. And Charlie, I think, as you know, is president of the soccer. Well, actually, um, Joel Wilson is the president. I'm just uh, the peon. I'm the. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, Charlie, tell us a little more about yourself. Um, Certainly. Uh, Charlie Graham. Um, I uh, have uh, six children from 31 down to 10, a uh, mixed family, uh, and uh, we have, all of them have been in soccer one way or another. Uh, the youngest one's now 10, so I figure i got about another 10 years before maybe I can uh, become maybe an emeritus status as opposed to uh, every day, every weekend. Um, love kids. Um, my day job's a computer network engineer, but my passion is sports and sports marketing, and uh, stealing this from uh, our mayor, if a child has a ball in his hand, it, he won't have a brick in his hand. So um, I firmly believe in that, uh, that, that philosophy, and anything I can do to help, 
uh, on the rec board to facilitate that, I will. Thank you. Questions, Mark? No, I'm, I'm good. You, was, you um, appeared before us um, several months ago. Um, refresh my memory on that. It's something to do with soccer. Yes, um, I'm uh, kind of spearheading a uh, fundraising campaign for um, putting lights on our uh, whatever the technical South Beach, wherever the library is, there's all these fields and has a real long name that I can't remember. Um, but I uh, facilitated uh, a grant for from Florida Youth Soccer Association for $50,000 that we're just waiting to spend once we uh, complete some grant applications and some other things to get uh, the, uh, the all the fields, well, at least one field started and then from that point on. You guys need to stop whistling at me. Whistling, no, it's not mine. That was mine. For the first Brian time. Brian was, Brian was <laughs> I, just, I just turned it off. And you I'm know, I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, so your choice is to be on the recreation board? I believe that's probably the best place for me to start. And uh, quite frankly, I do want to migrate around. And um, I, I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I love Satellite Beach. And uh, I've worked I, with Carrie before. I've worked with Carrie extensively, and she's been incredible. And so is uh, and Ms. Parker as well. So, um, and all of you councilmen, quite frankly. Um, I've been around a lot longer than it seems. Um, I'm not really as young as I hope I look. Um, and uh, I plan to stay in Satellite Beach forever. I'm actually, anyhow. Well, we're glad to have you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, you've, you've been before us many times in the past because I remember when I was on council before you would come up and, you know, when soccer was needing things or when you guys were looking at doing stuff, you've always been involved. And, and it's very commendable that you've put the devotion and time into soccer that you have. So um, I'm familiar with your background and thank you for volunteering. You're welcome. Brian has been poking at me. He wants to borrow your blimp. Okay, so my former career was I was the MetLife blimp pilot for seven years, and um, if it happens to be in town and you need a ride, um, if donations to the lighting project could compensate for a little ride on a MetLife blimp. Great. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you for the way. Thank you for the work with the soccer and that stuff. I'm sure we'll come out ahead there. And again, you heard what we said about how it works. You're welcome. Thank you. Any further business? With the uh, <coughs> interview board applicants, here and none. Close that portion of our work. Before you start. I'd like to call to order a special meeting of the City of Satellite Beach Council, October 1, 2014, approximately 645. And I'm going to open this as a public hearing to discuss and take action on the Florida Recreation Development Assistance Program <coughs> grant. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, we were before you um, a couple weeks ago, I believe, getting authorization to submit a $150,000 matching grant through FERDAP for the soccer lights. Um, we did um, put some thinking into um, a $50,000 grant for FERDAP, mostly because last year the only thing they funded was every $50,000 grant, regardless of points. So if you have submitted a grant, you got it. So um, we're thinking that there were items in our capital plan that were 50000 or less that we could um, submit a grant for. And the one that we chose was the um, Cinnamon Park Playground, which is just west of the Public Works Department. Um, it's only 50 by 70, so it's kind of a challenge. John and I had a challenge trying to get enough implements in their apparatuses to get enough points. Um, but we feel that we'll be able to put in... Um, with the grant, we'd be able to replace the existing playground, uh, replace the existing picnic table. Um, we have benches um, lined up, um, new fencing for that area, and um, we're working on developing a uh, children's exercise trail, which would pretty much be um, stations of uh, exercise functions along the fence. So a kid who's only three and the fence is looking pretty long if it's 50 feet anyway, you know, they go to like four or five different exercise trails and do squats or something like that and then at the end have some sort of cool reward. So um, it's this point that would make a very interesting playground, kind of like when we did the um, bike path down at the sports park. It was very unique. 
So we're hoping to um, have you all authorize the submission of a FERDAP grant for $50,000 non-matching for the Cinnamon Park improvements. I have a question. On your uh, grant authorization form, uh, the total project cost is $50,000, uh, but under rehab and replacement cost, you've got replacement of 25000 What are we talking about? Why the difference? The replacement of the playground would probably be somewhere around the twenty five thirty thousand, and then the picnic table and the other elements would bring it up to fifty. Okay. We plan to use all fifty thousand in our grant. Well, I'll move to authorize the recreation department to submit a FERDAP grant application for fifty thousand dollars for improvements to Cinnamon Park, with the total project cost of fifty thousand dollars and no city match. Second. I have a motion by <coughs> Vice Mayor Dot, second by Councilman Montanero. <coughs> Further discussion from this one question. Carrie, how much is, I mean, I've driven past there many times, usually in the middle of the day when it's really hot, but I, how much is this really park really used? It's used a lot. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. right. um, particularly walk. morning times in the summer, um, late afternoon. Courtney, you see people there a lot. Um, a lot of moms and strollers just walk down to that park. Yeah, you know, we all have our little <laughs> mouse that we travel to the city, and that's my way home, is coming down Cinnamon, and there's a there's always people in that park. I mean, I always, especially in the morning and in the evenings, there's always people there every day. And we were slated to, if I'm not mistaken, replace this anyway coming up, correct? It was on our application. Mm -hmm. Any further no, that's questions all I think. from council? At this time, open up for public, public comment on this item. Hearing none, back to council. Any further discussion? Hearing none, one more. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Any further business on this item? Hearing none. Close the public hearing and the meeting on this agenda item. Our next meeting will start at approximately seven o'clock. <coughs> Good evening. I'd like to call to order a regular. Meeting of the City Council Satellite Beach, October 1st, 2014, approximately 7 p.m. Please join me in a moment of silence in the pledge. And a pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'll go to agenda item three, which is citizens' comments. This is for non-agenda items. The floor is open for citizens' comments on non-agenda items. There are none. Close the citizens' comments, and I'll go to city council comments. Who would like to start? Cheryl, do you want to start? Do you have any council comments? Oh, no. I'll okay. wait. Thank you. Me? No. Okay. Uh, just, just one comment, and this is directed towards our chief. I uh, had an opportunity to run into a citizen the other night, Pat Utek, one of our former mayors, uh, and he wanted me to uh, express to you and to City Council, his appreciation for the stop by and say hi program. Uh, so if you pass that along to Linda. He said that's made a big difference in this community. There's a lot of lives being touched by that. He wanted to make sure that you know that and can keep going with it. And uh, to the council, he really appreciates all the activities that we're doing for our elder citizens. And uh, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. But Chief, thank you, sir, for your support of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on the 24th, I attended the uh, City Resiliency meeting, which was very well attended. Um, I thought there was a lot of positive input that came from the meeting, and uh, I just want to thank Courtney and the staff for putting that together. I think uh, you all did a great job. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. In lieu of meetings, I've been writing. <laughs> um, I also attended a resilient um, workshop we had, and I hope we have a few more on that also. And I think it was well attended, and thank you, whatever side you're on, for at least coming out. I appreciate it. Um, okay, I'm moving. Can I go? No. Oh, I, I, that's what I asked you before. I was getting ready. Okay. Sorry. No problem. 
Um, I also returned in the Resilient Community Workshop. Um, and then for those of you who are available on October 10th, the Do Dress Like a Lady um, event is coming up. It's for the Women's Shelter. Uh, Wayne Ivey will be the MC, and who knows what he's going to be dressed like. Um, if you would like tickets, come see me. Uh, a lot of people in the community are going, and their goal is to raise $100,000 for the Women's Shelter. And then I am a little bit concerned about the board membership. We have nine regular uh, vacancies and nine <coughs> alternate vacancies and uh, I was going through some old agendas and a couple years ago we were inundated with board applicants so it might not be a bad idea to go through those and try to solicit some people to get on those boards because we do have a lot of vacancies. And that's it. Thank you. Um, also to finish, football opening day, has that been rescheduled? You no, know? Yeah. Okay. It was a rain. rain Fields night. were underwater. So, um, okay, moving on to Agenda item six, presentation of a proclamation. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I thought you were pretty much tired of hearing me since we talk about five hours a day. Um, Courtney, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Um, please don't forget to register for the Precious Memories 5K sponsored by the city's recreation department in New Balance of Melbourne. That's going to be held this weekend, Saturday, October 4th. October 4th. Um, and I will be walking in that event. <laughs> Not running, but I'll be walking. Thank you. Yes. So we'll have some walkers in there. It is a, a walker-friendly, all-ages type 5K um, designed to benefit the Cancer Care Center's foundation. Um, so you can – I have the link um, in my report that you can use to sign up for that. If you don't have that link, you can use the – just go to Running Zone and find the event. Um, the city's kickoff meeting to our Creating Resiliency um, Community Project was held on September 23rd. We did have a good attendance for that um, meeting. We had 42 attendees sign in, and we had much more than that actually at the meeting. Um, it was sex, what, what we call very successful, and um, we will be now preparing the project survey instrument, which is, which is going to be designed by a company called MetroQuest. Um, and that will will start, um, I would say, approximately in, an, in about 30 days. And we will also have a booth at the Ocean Reef Beach Festival to get survey um, people to, to fill out that survey. And that that survey instrument will basically be the next step in obtaining information from the community on that on that topic. I did include the new um, Brevard County solid waste impact fees and solid waste charges from Brevard County in my report for your information. Um, I did also want to let you know that we are postponing the medical marijuana ordinance until October 15th, City Council. Um, basically, we because this, this is somewhat of a zoning ordinance, it needs to go to planning and zoning, um, so we're going to be doing that first. Um, I will be in Miami, Florida on October 8th. I'll be leaving in the evening, um, and I'll be out uh, October 9th and 10th for the annual Florida Redevelopment Association Conference. Um, our assistant city manager, Andy Stewart, will be acting manager during my absence. I also wanted to let you know that there is a public workshop regarding transportation Monday, October 6th from 1 to 4 at the Congressman Bill Posey's Conference Center at the Brevard County Health Department. Um, that's right next to the Government Center on Judge Fran Jamison Way. And this is actually a task force created by Governor Scott to identify um, recommendations for future transportation corridors connecting Brevard, Orange, and Osceola counties. So if you're interested in that, please attend that workshop. I, I definitely will be at that workshop. Um, on my an action item, we emailed to Council last evening the special edition of the Beach Caster for your approval this evening that will, has to do with the water utility, uh, stormwater utility. This was um, prepared uh, in a draft format by staff and, and edited by um, Councilman Gott. So we were asking for your approval of that. That will go out as soon as we give that, get that to the printer and out to the public. Um, since it's an action item, um, discussion. From council? I think I think it's pretty appropriate that we're sending it out now, especially after all the rain that we've had. You know, it kind of reinforces in people's minds the fact that, you know, water does collect on our street. It still does. You know, even with the improvements that we've done, there's still some areas that need attention. So, um, you know, we've been looking to do this for a while, and I'm glad it's done. Thank you very much. 
Um, I did before I um, I did want to just say that the editing of this by Councilman Gott probably saved me at least three days of work. So I wanted to give her a big thank you. It was a, definitely a time saver, and I'd like to thank John Fergus as well for helping us put that together. Okay. And just to correct the record, it wasn't just edited; it was rewritten. Yes, <laughs> and it was a bear. And I want to point out that. Um, when I looked at it with fresh eyes again this morning, I uh, found some things that bothered me. So I have reworded one of the sentences so that it reads more smoothly, and I have changed some of the nomenclature um, so that it is used consistently throughout the document. Um, your but figures all, and all that are staying Nothing else same. has changed. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from Council? Okay. Here, none, since it is an action item, I will open it up the floor for public comment. Here are none. Is there any public comment? Please. Good evening, Jerry Hudson, President. Um, it's kind of like uh, putting this out after the stormwater utility fee was already voted for and passed. It's kind of like closing the barn door after the horses have gotten out. What's the point? Thank you. I will answer that if someone else wants to, too, but I'm going to say this. If you lived in this city, I know you've lived here a while, we do have an issue with storm water. Um, if you saw it during this past rain events, and I think it's important to let people know that we do have problems here and still, and a lot of this piping is very old in the city, definitely needs replacement. We've done a lot, but there's still a lot more left to be done with it. And as we wait, costs continue to skyrocket, and we need to tackle this because of what also what the state has put up, mandated us for the lagoon system. So um, I think we would have, I know I would have voted for this, whether this came out prior to or after the fact as it is now, because it, it's critical that we preserve the lagoon, and it's critical to save people's houses and so forth from flooding on streets that have very old piping and so forth that we really need to do something about. If I could just add, I'm pretty, I don't, you probably didn't get the phone calls after Tuesday's rain, but I know our staff did, and um, we had to actually have police out at Jackson to keep people from driving down that road and breaking down. Um, I, I, the reason I think is that this is important is to make sure people know we're going to do something about that. Plan. Is that's where I get the questions. It's not about the rate. It's what are you when are you going to do these projects and when when are you going to get that done? That's what the people that talk to me about it care about is is you know when are you going to fix it? So that's what I think is important that we let the community know that we have a plan to do that. <coughs> Thank you. Further comments? Yeah. We're doing this to explain to our residents why we felt the need to increase the stormwater utility fee. This is a complex issue, and I always appreciated if people explain things to me in a simple way to simplify complex issues. And when I did this document, it occurred to me that there are four questions that our residents will ask. How did we get here? What's the problem? How much will it cost and how will we fix it? And so <clears throat> for each of these two uh, elements of the stormwater issue, that's exactly how I went about addressing it. And um, based on the reaction to special edition beach casters I've done for this city in the past, my prediction is that our residents will appreciate having this information brought to them, clearly stated, um, and, and with legitimate justification for why we increase the fee. Thank you. Um, public comment is still open. If there's any further public comment on this action item. Here and then close it back to council. Yes, I have a question. Are the photos on the first page, were they just taken or were these taken during another rain? Taken in September. Mm -hmm. In September? Yes, yeah, this past, this past <laughs> actually, this, the two, two weeks ago. prior to the meeting, the resilient <clears throat> We need a motion. Yes, we were asking council. I'll make to a motion this. to approve the uh, special edition of the beachcaster with the stormwater management uh, 
topic. I have a motion by Councilman Montanero, second. second by Councilman Breimer, to accept the Stormwater Management Special Edition. Um, further discussion from this one last thing. Lorraine, thank you for this. And, and Ms. Barker, appreciate the work as well from your team. So very nicely done. And John Fergus. And John Fergus. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Yeah, just one comment. I, I, I don't, and I think I've said this over and over, and I'm just going to say it one more time. I, I, I really thought this should have went out before the, the uh, assessment was raised. It, it, you know, it was supposed to be done on a step plan from 65 to 85 to 104, and then it went from 65 to 104. And I think that um, notifying the residents before that increase happened was probably the prudent thing to do, so I'm not going to support it. Okay, thank you. Okay, further comments? Here in Eleanor. Councilman Dina? No. Vice Mayor Dodd? Yes. Councilman Breyer? Yes. Councilman Montero? Yes. Yes, motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, Courtney, is that your report? Thank you very much. I have a question for the city manager. Okay. Um, it's my understanding there was a hearing on Monday regarding the Gorsh case. Can you give us an update on that? Uh, yes, the Clarks, uh, which are the neighbors adjacent to the Gersh's, um, filed a motion to intervene into the case, and the, that motion was denied by Judge Motley, who felt that the city could argue all of their points for them, basically, so they didn't have anything really to add to the case, um, so the intervention was denied. Okay. Any further questions for the city manager? Okay. Hearing none, move on to agenda item six. Uh, presentation of a proclamation recognized in October as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, Melody Arnold's here to accept it. And Mark Reimer, some of you would read it. Yeah, Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Arnold, come on up. Uh, this is a proclamation by the City of Satellite Beach. It says, whereas breast cancer, which is one of the common cancers diagnosed in the United States, more than 200,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year, that is one out of every eight women. And whereas understanding the risk factors associated with this illness is essential to prevention, older women and those with a personal or family history of breast cancer are at greater risk for developing an illness. And whereas breast cancer is an unpredictable disease with no exact cause. However, learning more about the symptoms and the diagnosis and getting mammogram screens can help with early detection is critical to prevention and whereas the American Cancer Society raises money for educational programs and Susan J. Cronin Foundation raises money for research and early detection and whereas coming together as a community to support mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, and all others who have been impacted, we can all strive to inspire and strengthen the cause through education and research to find a cure, to ensure a future free from illness, and whereas the pink ribbon is the most prominent symbol of breast cancer awareness, and in most countries, the month of October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The fight for a cure is never ending, and the challenge is that someday we will save more and more lives. Now, therefore, uh, Mark Prime, on behalf of the Mayor of Satellite Beach, Mr. Frank Catino, you hereby proclaim October 2014 as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We'd like to provide you this from our citizens of Satellite Beach and from our city council. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. If you'd like to make any comments, please do. Well, on behalf of Breast Friends Organization, which I'm a part of, um, I want to thank the city of Satellite Beach. I'm also a resident of the city of Satellite Beach, and so I'm very proud to be here and accept it tonight. And, uh, T-shirts that you see over there on behalf of our fire department here and also the police department are so supportive of us and of the women and um, the families that are going through this. And we are very grateful for everything. Glad to know about If there's anything you can do, please let us know. Thank okay. you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Moving on, I'm going to open agenda item 7 for a public hearing to discuss, take action on ordinance number 1094. Jim? Ordinance number 1094, an ordinance of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, amending the transportation element of the 1998 comprehensive plan as amended. 
based on the City's updated data and analysis, revising and updating existing goals, objectives, and policies in accordance with the mandates set forth in Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, authorizing transmittal of these amendments to the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, State Land Planning Agency, and other applicable agencies for review and comment as required by Florida Statutes, providing a conflicts clause and severability clause, providing an effective date. It's the second reading of Ordinance Number 1094. Thank you. Motion to approve Ordinance Number 1094 on second reading. I have a motion by Councilman Second. Farmer, second by Councilman Montanero. Questions from Council? I have just a minor change on page two, the section four. <coughs> the sentence that starts, that all ordinances, you need to delete that. The sentence should, should read all ordinances or parts of ordinances. And I'll amend my motion. I'll amend the second. Thank you. I have, I have a question. Okay. I'm on a map. It's a map that's 2-6, 2-6, um, figure 2-1, and it shows a future roadway. And it lists signalized intersections, but it doesn't list the intersection at Cassia and South Patrick Drive as being signalized. Now, that is our signal, or is that Indian Harbor Beach? We we looked and got that signal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not on the map. I think it needs to be on the map. Yeah, we can change that. We can add right that. No, actually, it's right here. Good catch, no. no. <coughs> um, I'm going to ask about one other one since you brought that up, Tom. How about the one at what is called Patrick Drive on South Patrick? Is that our signal? Mm -hmm. That's not, okay. That's not ours, Dan. Okay. Just making sure we got along. Thank you. Any further comments? <coughs> there are none at this time. I'll open public hearing on ordinance number, public discussion on ordinance number 1094. Steve Headley, resident. On figure two, five. Future bicycle and pedestrian paths. 2.5, you said, Steve? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. It's 2. No, I couldn't read it and then okay. mumbled. Um, Steve, excuse me just one second. Sure. Is it a, a map you're re two, referring to? Future bicycle and pedestrian is 210. 210. Thank you. It's figure 25 at the top, but it's page 210 at the bottom. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry. Thanks, Steve. No, I just want to make yeah. sure we have it in front of us. You That's have the figure, right? It's, it's different at the bottom. Okay, thank you. My figure is round, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, Tom. Um, I look at this, and, and obviously, for those who have seen me riding around, know I'm a big bicycle person, pedestrian. But is it really our plan, considering the number of the amount of water we're talking about running off into the St. John's River to increase non-permeable surfaces in the city. I, I mean, it's just something to consider down the road. I don't, I'm not looking for an answer tonight. It was, as I was going through the, the agenda item today, I, that came across my mind that if we're doing this, and we're looking at runoff and, and everything. That's a that's a large chunk of, of non permeable surfaces, and we may want to look at. I don't, I'm not sure other things, but maybe some permeable bike paths because they are made nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Public comment portion is still open on ordinance number 1094. Hearing no further, bring back the council. Further council comments? Hearing none, Lenore? Yes. Vice Chair Yes. Montanero? Yes. Yes. Yes, motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item eight presentation by police department on the Florida law on golf carts. Chief? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a very brief history on how we got here. Several years ago, I believe it was Councilman 
Mike Chase, who first mentioned the desire that some community members had to want to operate golf carts in Satellite Beach. And, of course, I went back and researched it and found the, uh, the law that governs golf carts on county roads, city roads, state roads, things like that. And looking at, at that, uh, those laws and the requirements, it was quite extensive, um, very time-consuming, and very expensive because we're talking about infrastructure, infrastructure changes, signage, ordinances, creation, uh, all kinds of things. So with that information, it was determined that maybe now is not the time to do it. So it kind of went by the wayside, as they say. A couple years ago, it was brought up again. I went back and looked to see if there was any alternatives, any changes, any other options. There was none. The law had not changed. It had all the same requirements that it did the prior time. I presented the same information again and said, you know, it, it can be done. It's, it's expensive. It's extensive. There's infrastructure changes, widening sidewalks, signage, you know, things like that. Well, recently, the uh, law was changed with under low-speed vehicles to now give an option to someone who has a golf cart to convert a golf cart to low speed to a low-speed vehicle. In essence, the requirements are a little bit less than if they were to do it prior under the golf cart statute and the requirements are just all incumbent upon the person that owns the golf cart. They purchase this golf cart, they convert it to a low speed vehicle, they have it registered at the tag office and they're all set and they can drive on the streets, they can drive on the, uh, the roadways and do the things that they need to do anywhere within the city of Satellite Beach, not anywhere near South Patrick because it has to be um, can't exceed 25 miles an hour, or can't be on roads with a speed limit uh, higher than 35 miles an hour, which of course there is not any roads in Satellite Beach that are that in, in the inner city, excluding A1A and South Patrick that are at that speed. So with that, we are starting to see people that are and have converted and now now are operating low speed vehicles with the triangle in the back of their uh, golf cart and they're perfectly legal, they're operational, they're licensed, they're tagged by the DMV, the operator has to have a license, they have to have insurance, and the proper equipment that goes with it that is covered in the uh, low speed vehicle law, and they're operational. So at this point, my recommendation to you as the, as the police chief would be to, that we don't need to take any action now because we were struggling to try to find at a time in the past, how we could allow people to do this. And the only way we had would be to go through all those things that I mentioned earlier. Now we have an option to where people can do what they want to do. They can, they can convert their low speed vehicle or they can just purchase one as a low speed vehicle. Uh, and they can operate them safely and legally on the roadways. And we don't have to create ordinances. We don't have to take on any liability. We don't have to widen sidewalks, notify people, put up signage or anything like that. So it would appear to me that that would be the, the most prudent way to, to, to handle it. So um, I'm just here to kind of give the information, answer questions, and then obviously it's the, the council's decision on you know, which way we go. But that would be my recommendation. A question Sir. for you. Um, can you cross roads that have a speed limit of greater than 35? Could someone come across, go across South Patrick or A1A? Okay, because we're talking about two different things. You have to, are we, are, are you asking that question if you're in a golf cart? Or are you asking that, or if you're in a low speed vehicle? Well, I'm gonna. Or both. Both. Or both. Okay. <laughs> On a golf cart, no, you can't, unless you petition FDOT, have them come down and do a survey, have them make sure there's the proper markings, the proper, uh, uh, Signal signalization if it's needed based on the roadway, and then they would give permission for golf carts to be crossed at that particular location. Okay, that's the answer to, to it if it's a golf cart. If it's a low speed vehicle, then it can cross A1A or South Patrick without any problem. Okay, that's, now let me ask that's it. low speed. So if somebody buys a golf cart, I mean, I know many people I've worked for have golf carts on their boats actually. Um, if it goes no more than 25 miles an hour, then it's technically considered, even though it's a golf cart, a low-speed vehicle. No, that's there's more requirements than that. I mean, that that's met, the main one. Okay, yeah. that met the requirements such as yes. headlamps, stop lamps, turn Correct. signals, then you can... And the little triangle on the back, okay. yes. Even though it's the same vehicle, <clears throat> okay. Right. 
Thank you. No, I just wanted to clarify that, too, because I, I read into some of this. There have been these vehicles have been on the road. I mean, there's people that I see down in Melbourne Beach that have been using <coughs> low speed vehicles for a while. They were tagged and they were out there two years, three years ago. I was seeing them on the roads. Um, I, I think your your assumption or your recommendation to us is, is pretty common sense. I travel through Vieira. Um, I see what golf cart use is there, and I don't think that's what I want to see as golf cart use here because I see kids who are abusing the privilege of their parents allowing them to use the golf cart with four or five or six kids on a golf cart hanging off the back, and I don't think that's what we want to have going on in Satellite Beach. It's a liability issue for the, not only the parents, but it would be a liability issue for the city, too, in, in the way I would look at it, as if you guys aren't catching them doing this, then who's responsible? I think if there's provisions that are out there that allow people to use low-speed low vehicles and do it legitimately with a driver's license, with insurance, um, I'm all for it. That was my, my point. We, we had been laboring for several years on a way to get people the ability to, to get in a golf cart type vehicle and traverse the city. Now they have a way to do it. And we don't have to make changes or widen sidewalks or all those other things. So th that was why I made that recommendation. It just seems like common sense to me. And, you know, I, I did a little checking, too. I think it's about a $500 difference in a <laughs> golf cart and a bottom-of-the-line low-speed vehicle. Now, you can go, you can get them all the way up with all more bells and whistles on them, with more accessories and more bling, but it's about $500 difference from a regular golf cart. Yeah, honestly, we, we just looked at the you know, laws and the impact. I, I didn't do any research on prices. Uh, I will say, just as a point to, to clarify, just to make sure that we have, you know, full information, the, the, the one... The one advantage, and I think the only real advantage that I can think of now to going to all that work and creating an ordinance would be you could be more restrictive than the state statute has right now. I don't see where that benefit is anywhere near worth it to go through all that work when we have an option that's handed right to us that says, here you go, you can accomplish what you've been wanting to accomplish, and already doing it. We've already see people out, they're driving around, we wave to them as they go by us. I mean, it's, we, you know, if we see their low speed thing, they got their little tag and they're, they're fine. They're legal. Uh, one question real quick. I can tell you the, there is a place in Florida, the villages, and if you've ever been up through there, um, the golf carts are probably the preferred way of transportation there. And the ones that I have noticed all have the turn signals and so forth on them, it's kind of um, very prevalent there. I mean, they have everything you said here on them. I think they're a planned community, though, where they was built prior to that being a developed area. Right. It was built with that in mind. And, of course, we're, we're, we're not, so we would have to retrofit almost, you know. To but they, they're on the streets. I mean, absolutely. The same streets and so forth. And, you know, if we are a progressive community, which I really feel we are, we're looking at alternative ways for people to have transportation more clean than we have now. So, you know, I, I think it's fine. Um, on the low-speed vehicle uh, statute, it says that uh, you have to have in the procession a valid driver's license. Is that just a regular driver's license? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And for the golf cart, it says minimum age of 14. So because of this regular driver's license provision under low-speed vehicles, we're talking minimum age of 16. Is that right? To, to have one of these I, streets? Yeah. I, believe, I believe you could drive one with a permit at 15, right? A scooter? I, I think if you have a permit, you can drive it at, at With 15. somebody. Okay. If somebody's with yeah. you, is that right? Okay. Well, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> You're, are you familiar with Barefoot Bay, Chief? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's all county. The county sheriff's department runs Yes, sir. Um, there are main roads through there, and you kind of hit on it. Uh, it it's you get regular room for a car, but they've got a lane that's wider than a bicycle lane, and that's where most of these vehicles run. Um, 
I mean, it could be problematic in our city because, I mean, people just blow right past those carts as they're going all through there. But um, it seems to be fairly safe. But it's one of those things where I, I think some of our citizens are going to want to, do they pass it? Do they stay behind it? That kind of thing. But, but down there, everybody passes those things. It's kind of like Frank said with the villages. It's built that way, but nobody rides behind those things. They pass them, and, and those carts move to the right so that, Everybody and I completely agree. And I would submit that we have the same issues with uh, scooters and mopeds and skateboarders and other things that are out driving around. And, and people have to manage it and handle it safely. And, and uh, I personally think it's safer, looking at just these two options, it's safer to have them on the street tagged with a licensed driver who understands the road, the signage, et cetera, than to have them on sidewalks where people are trying to ride their bike, walk yeah. their dogs, they come up to a car that's parked in a driveway, blocking the sidewalk. They have to now drive over someone's yard around the car. It's 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 just a problem, and and that's I think the way it is now. We should uh, let them let them have it registered, do it, and uh, they're on their way. Um, I have a couple questions. When did, do you know when the law changed? What year? We were made aware of it, I think, seven months ago when we found somebody. Did you see a... I didn't see anything that uh, had any... We, we, we didn't get any notifications, which we normally do, which is kind of odd, but we, we noticed it about seven months ago is when we saw the first one and checked into it and realized that, that they were there. So when it, when it started, I, I don't know, but we became aware of it about seven months ago. Okay, because I actually pulled the statute, and I'm getting 20 miles per hour or less <coughs> is a golf cart. And anything above 20 miles an hour is a low-speed vehicle, yeah, 20 fine. miles an hour. So right. I think and it's, it's good if that's true. Know, people are going to listen to this or hear this, that a golf cart is less than 20 miles an hour. Correct. And it can be driven from dusk until dawn unless we allow it to be driven after that. That's so correct. So it doesn't need all the bells and whistles and doesn't need to be uh, have all the road safety things. No, actually, no, it does. Everything you said is right, but you, in order to be a golf cart and to be driven, it still has to have – the uh, brake, lights. brake lights and well, you got it right here. Steering, review mirror, reflectorized yeah, warning but devices. It's not like a low speed vehicle. Where you're saying you have to be 16 or older to right. drive it. Right. So I, I asked Courtney to put some information in front of everyone to take a look at. I'm not opposed to this as long as it's restricted. In other words, I live in the fountain. <clears throat> So a child that's 14, why can't he just stay in that community and ride a golf cart? I don't see us being in and pick up his friends and go fishing or whatever. I don't see the city being inundated like a golf cart community. But I don't see I don't think so any either. issue with allowing standard golf carts that, and it's not $500 to change from a low speed a golf cart to a low speed vehicle. It's between five and eight thousand dollars. So if you're going to get up to fifteen thousand dollar range to have a golf cart in this community, buy a car. But I've been asked by elderly people, why can't we have golf carts so that we can go during the day to Publix or, or whatever and go on the back streets? We don't have any streets that are over 25 miles an hour anyway, except for South Patrick Drive and A1A. And if we wanted to cross those, we would just go to the DOT and petition them. But why not try it on a, a limited basis and allow it in certain neighborhoods and see how it goes? We can always uh, take it back. But right now, what people, they want to go green. And again, I've been, I know, uh, Former Councilman Chase put it on the agenda. I also put it on the agenda, but I don't ever remember it coming before us. It just kind of uh, uh, fell off um, the agenda. But to go to expense to have a low-speed vehicle versus a golf cart, I'm a little confused about that. And low-speed vehicles, we're not actually allowing them. The state law allows them. Correct. They can come that's here exactly anyway right. that's, and that's do whatever they want to that's, do. That's the point. But we don't have to do anything. Saying is, what, what I'm saying is why not allow golf carts in limited areas? And so people don't have to go to the expense of. The, the state already allows golf carts in, in areas. So that's what this chief is saying is we don't have to do anything. We, uh, what, what we can do is put these parameters in what we we're planning to do is create an article in the Beachcaster telling people what the state statutes is so they understand that if they have a golf cart and their golf cart is equipped this way, then they can drive their golf cart around. But, but they just can't really cross the roads. Cart. It's a low-speed vehicle. No, there's two There's two levels. Just real quick on the golf cart issue. Before you can actually put a golf cart on the roadway, you have to have, you have to prove it. The city then has to also put the signage out, allowing, letting everybody know that this is a golf cart. 
area that you have in whatever roadways the city decides to do. Uh, any safety surveys that need to be done, the city has to perform and has to get with DOT, if, especially if you're going to allow uh, golf carts to be driven on road, I mean on sidewalks. Sidewalks would then have to be expanded because they can't be on anything smaller than uh, about eight feet. Uh, so there's a lot of requirements that you still, the city has to do for the golf carts. You can't just put them on a roadway. They actually have to be uh, by an ordinance or at least by signage. Now, if you do decide to let golf carts drive at night to morning, then an ordinance has to be passed indicating uh, that it requires extra uh, safety items. If so, I, I need to clarify, I just want to get clear on, on golf carts. So right now, if somebody came with a golf cart lower than 25 miles an hour, the person driving that, can he in our city, or must that person have a valid driver's license, even though it's a golf cart, okay? And must they have reflectors and all that stuff still, because that's a safety issue, correct? Well, you're... You're kind of, it's kind of two different things. If, if you're on the ninth hole and you divert to go to 7-Eleven across the street because you want to get something to drink and you're in a true legitimate golf cart by its, by its original definition to be played or to be driven on a golf course, then it cannot go on any city streets, period. Absolutely under no circumstance, no matter who's driving it. If you want that vehicle to be able to legally go on the streets, you have to do the things that we talked about. That's really just comes down to that. And, and, and unfortunately, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, my response to that would be, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to, to say, well, we're going to enforce the law, you know, here a little bit differently than over there. And I'm not sure that's a decision for you all to make if you want to create ordinances and do all that thing and widen sidewalks to, to legally allow them in certain little areas uh, as a test case. That's, that's not my decision. but. Um, but my recommendation is there's an avenue for people to get where they want to get legally and safely and properly, and we don't have to do anything about it, take any liability, spend any money, and yet everybody wins. And to me, I can't think of a better win situation. I, I see the only difference is, yeah, there's going to be some added expense. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about $15,000, but, yes, there's certainly a low-speed vehicle conversion is going to be more than just a standard golf cart. That's just a fact, but, hey, that's is what it is. Um, let me ask this question. How many people, Chief, have you gotten that has called you saying, hey, we want to drive a golf cart in this city? Do we get two a month, five a month, you know? I would say two a month is probably, we probably get, I get asked it more when I'm out in the community. I don't, I don't get a lot of people actually calling the police department asking to talk to me to ask me that. But whenever they see me, I get that a lot. And as a matter of fact, I've driven to people's houses that I know need them and use them, and I've dropped off copies of this and explained, wow, look, now you're all set. You can, And they've, they've been very happy. As a matter of fact, uh, one particular person, we offered up a, an Eagle Scout project to help him convert his golf cart to a low-speed vehicle. So, You know, here's the way I look at it. Low speed, if someone went out and bought a golf cart to drive around, I still see these items, headlamp stops and all that, as being a safety factor there. And my feeling is if you don't have them, liability issues and so forth there, and I think it's just safety for people. I think it's safety. Thanks, Tim. It's a safety issue. Those are normal things. I can tell you the Bahamas, and a lot of places I've been there, golf carts are a mainstay in a lot of the areas. Sure. They have turn signals, and they're standard. I mean, they're golf carts, and they have brake lights, and they have rearview mirrors and so forth on them when the people purchase them over there or even rent them. They're all equipped like that. Um, I think they're safety factor. I don't think a golf cart – I would like to see more golf carts being used. I think it's cleaner. But I really don't want to take away the safety factor to start. Maybe that's down the road when people – when society gets used to golf carts being on the road and so forth. But um, – I think if somebody really wants one, those are more safety things than anything. But I and based on that, if somebody really wants them and they, let's say they cost almost as much as a car, well, you're still saving on gas, you're saving on insurance, and you're saving on maintenance, and you're helping the environment. So you're still, you're still ahead of the game either way. But that's a decision that the people have to make. Well, and just a, the difference between a golf cart that's able to operate in the evening and a low-speed vehicle, 
is seatbelts, it sounds like. Yep. Um, both have to, both require Headlight. headlights, both require brake lights and turn signals. Um, I guess rear view mirror. So seatbelts, rear view mirror would be the difference in. Tag light, I think. In a tag light, yeah. Right, in a vent. Right, a vehicle. So, and both require windshields. So you're looking at the difference between a low speed vehicle and a golf cart that can operate in the evening or at night as having to add when uh, seat belts um, have a vehicle identification number and um, tag and tag light um, and a rear view mirror sorry yeah I, I have it here too a low speed vehicle must be equipped with headlight headlamps stop lamps turn signal lamps tail lights reflux reflex ref reflectors parking brakes rear view mirrors windshield seat belts and vehicle identification numbers must be registered and stored and you must be 16 or have a valid driver's license but a golf cart only if you operate it after sunset mm -hmm. has to have uh, headlights brake lights turn signals and windshield I think what a lot of people are saying why can't we have golf carts and operate them during the daylight hours to do things um, and not have to go to the expense to do all that so that's what I'm getting. I'm getting it not from kids, but, you know, parents, especially on the west side, who are constantly driving to drop their kids off in that community, and also elderly who are, have been calling me. Mr. Donaldson, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight, uh, former superintendent of the school board. His wife is ill, but he's like, well, you know, why can't we have a golf cart to run the Publix or to run our, our errands during the daylight hours? So, you know, I don't see a compromise. Maybe we could on a limited basis we'll try it between sunrise and sunset and see where it goes. I don't see us being inundated with golf carts and just limit the areas where they can be used. Well, that still doesn't eliminate the need for the city to do the survey, post the signs, get approval from FDOT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, widen the sidewalks to eight feet and so forth that, that has that tremendous upfront cost for the city, which really is not viable or feasible for the city. Um, and also, I'm confused about the speed limit of the, of the golf carts. I don't see anything in the statute that uses speed of the golf cart as a uh, distinguisher. And, and so my, my question is, if I had a golf cart that can do 20 miles an hour max, uh, I could still retrofit that to turn it into a low speed vehicle if I put all of these low speed vehicle elements on the cart. Is, isn't that correct? Right. So the speed of the golf cart really is irrelevant. It's what you have uh, attached or installed on, on the vehicle. Correct. It's more safety. If, I mean, when you read these things, it's a golf cart that has some safety on it, it has a turn signal has a, a brake light see so to me it's more of a safety so you could get a regular golf cart and do a, a few minors because a lot of the golf carts nowadays come with headlights and stuff that are standard so I we but can't I look at them all as a safety <coughs> item on the cart that I would think you would want if you had kids and so forth driving it you would want them to have anyway so the, the difference at night. between a legal street legal golf cart and a street legal, I'm just using that term to make it, and a street legal uh, low speed vehicle is, is relatively negligible. You still need brakes, tires, uh, safe tires, reliable steering, rear view mirror, reflectorized, reflect, reflection devices. So you still need to have some of the things, not as many, but you, you, you do need to have some. And, and that's, just the, that's just the difference that, that they want them to be safer and when they're out operating, and I don't think that's a bad thing. So, so one thing is, Joe, do you want it to be where you don't have to be 16 years of age to operate it? So a 12-year-old or 14-year-old kid, if you have parents? to be 14 or older. Okay, you have to, I was just trying. And to... it would only be operated from sunrise to dusk in limited areas. It doesn't mean you have to allow access across A1A or South Patrick Drive. You don't have to allow that. You don't have. To, if we don't want to, it's a good. It's a. It's a starting point to see if it's something we'd be interested in doing, but but instead of going to the expense of a street legal, low speed vehicle because it's not really golf. Am I right? There's yes. A low speed vehicle, yes. vehicle on a golf cart. There's a big difference. Yes, there is. Um, 
And then I'm not understanding this infrastructure. We, the golf cart would drive on the streets, which are all 25 miles an hour anyway. So it, basically, most of the time, I see you guys out there all, all morning, we're going under 25 miles an hour most of the day anyway, dropping our kids off at school. So um, I, can't, I don't see, golf carts can't go above 20 miles an hour. I don't see them zipping all over the city um, or, or anything like that. So um, all of our streets are 25 miles an hour or less anyway, except for South Patrick Drive and A1A. And we wouldn't allow them on there, but we're not going to create trails and pass for them. They would be on the streets and pull over and things like that, like a, a regular low-speed vehicle would have to do, correct? Technically, they're illegal on the street. Yeah. I mean, they are illegal. You've already said you can't get on the street with a standard golf cart. Well, right. that's Correct. what I'm saying. We and, could create an ordinance to allow it in and, certain and areas. So you well, you have to create that ordinance. We have to do all of this other stuff. Right. And what the they, other stuff is the expense part of this. When there's already a mechanism that the state has given us to allow people to use a golf cart on our streets. And the ordinance actually applies if you decide to allow golf carts during the hours of sunset to sunrise. Uh, the city can actually say they want golf carts, but the only thing is that the city takes expense on everything. Uh, the city then has to petition DOT if they plan to cross any roadways that are highways, South, South Patrick and A1A. Uh, the main thing here is that the city then has to go ahead and they can put the information out and actually let people drive it, but you know, we've got to understand it'd be 14 year olds out there. They do not have to pull to the right at all on a golf cart. The city's just the one that says, yes, we allow it to do it that way. It is illegal in the state of Florida to put any golf cart on a roadway, but they allow cities to go ahead and do it. The reason that DOT will not let you tag a vehicle that doesn't have all the requirements because they make sure it's a lot stricter before they allow a vehicle on their roadways. Um, in turn, that's what we want to say, is that our vehicle code should be the same way. We want it to be just as restrictive as it is for anyone to be out on, on any other highway or roadway. Um, I, one thing I, I'm having a hard time grasping, I personally don't see, Courtney, a huge difference between what you're saying, a low speed and a golf cart. Given this, they all need to have headlamps. See, every golf cart I've seen has headlamps, stop lamps pretty standard, maybe turn signal isn't, tail light, ref reflectors, they all have brakes, rear view mirrors, they have mirrors, they have a windshield that comes up. So seat belts are the only other thing. Identification number isn't a huge cost to it. So really, a golf cart meets almost all these, except maybe you're going to have to have a turn signal and a seat belt if it doesn't have it. And those are safety items. Yeah. So I just don't see, I mean, I would like to see people in the city be able to use them. I think it's future, it's greener and so forth. And for the little bit of difference, because I don't see this huge difference between a golf cart and a low speed the dollar. Cost line. difference, yeah. Well, they come with it. But then I want to know, on a low speed, tell me what it doesn't have. Why don't we bring it back and we'll what, have what, that information. Well, again, my question is, what doesn't a low speed vehicle have that it needs to qualify. Well, if it's a turn signal and seat belts, I think, it's a, it's I think a the difference issue. is is if the city were to allow golf carts only during the day, there would be a difference between the low speed and the golf cart. My only concern with that is that would be an enforcement nightmare for the police department because you have, you know, the dusk. And then you have, you know, well, I'm only going to run up to the store and, <laughs> you know, game. right, or I'm only going to the football game. And so if we were to do that, I would strongly recommend if we were going to do a golf cart, anything, to make sure that it's allowed at night, too, cause the, and require the headlights and all that. Otherwise, you know, we just we just create a, a disaster for people who only want to run up to the store and, you know, and then they end up getting tickets. And I can guarantee if we tried to, only during the day that shortly thereafter we would be regulating nighttime too. Well, I have a question. If you think it's only a matter of cost and it's just a, a one safety issue, then what's the difference if we allow an ordinance to allow golf carts then? Well, we already well, have it. Right no, now. it's low speed vehicles. Well, but, but, if the cost is then is up to the up to the, the, the person who purchase it, purchases it. That's why I'm asking this question is if you have a, a golf cart, I went out and bought a golf cart 
And most of the golf carts I have seen have windshields, headlights, tail light, and brake lights. I mean, I see them all the time. Bahamas every place. Those are pretty standard items on it. If those are standard items, what are the additional costs that makes it so much more to do it? If it's only a turn signal and seat belts, I, I don't so you're, see that. You're making I, a big assumption. I think maybe we need some real I, data. I, I've, I've seen all the cost. tons of them. So. The, the, one of the issues that, I mean, I understand what you're trying to get out between the distinctions between the vehicles, so to speak. But the real issue is what the obligation to the city is in order to, quote, right. implement an ordinance that allows golf carts on the street. And the statute requires that in order to do that, before the city designates a street or streets to allow golf carts to be on those streets, you have to do the survey, you have to post the signs on the street that indicate where those golf carts are going to be. And that's where the real, it's not, it's not per se a cost of the golf cart issue from the city's perspective per se, it's more of what the city has to do in order to quote, authorize golf carts to be on the street and then if they want to go on from side to side from South Patrick and side to side on A1A, they may not ever be able to do that because last time we went through this, I think it was when Mike Chase was on the council, we actually went to DOT and they told us they would not give us, I think I have a letter someplace where they actually said back then that they were not going to authorize a golf cart crossing on A1A. Hmm. And I can, I can go try and find it if you want me to, but I mean, that's my recollection. I think, I think we could bring it back to you for some cost of what, an estimates, I guess. Because I think the city would have to weigh, you know, is it worth doing all that, what Jim just said, to save somebody the cost of having to install seat belts and getting a vehicle identification number? That's and put in a rear view mirror. When everybody was done, that's exactly the point I was going to make. Is that, that's, that's really what we, we still have to do traffic it. surveys. We still have to put up signage. We, we can't just create an ordinance and say this area from A to B, you're going to be able to do it. Go buy a standard golf cart and do it. It's just not that so, simple. So we're going to have a scenario that if we go with what you've recommended, people can drive on any street they want. Correct. They can drive at night, and there's no restrictions other than the fact that they have to be 16 years old and have a driver's license or exactly. whatever. And exactly and right. And if we don't do that, then we've got to pick specific streets. We've got to get a survey done. We've got to do all that. Signage. And then what happens when somebody goes off that street and gets on a street that's not allowed? So we're back to an enforcement issue. I mean, there's a mechanism in place that allows this to happen. Why are we arguing about this? Mr. Mayor, please. Okay. Yes. I want to make a motion that uh, the city policy regarding the use of golf carts on city streets be governed by Florida Statute 316.2122 regarding the operation of low-speed vehicles. I'll second that. I have a motion by Councilwoman, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Dott, uh, second by Councilman Montanero. This time I'm going to open it up for public comment on this agenda item before we go any farther. I have a golf cart, uh, Richard Charbonneau, um, Emerald, Willow, uh, Kale Street, and a few others I can't remember. Um, the golf cart uh, that I have is probably not street legal. It's got some of the stuff on it. I went over to the uh, golf cart place at um, Palm Shores. And to put the brakes, uh, the brake lights, and to have directionals uh, and the mirror and the license plate light and all that is about 500 bucks. I checked because I was going to do it. We use that for campaigning. Now, one of the other things I would point out is that uh, you saw me kind of limp up here. I don't really have a bad knee, even though I lie to people. I had a stroke, and um, it left kind of like my knee paralyzed. I don't know how to describe it. But uh, the golf cart for me has been really a, you know, a, a really good thing lately. A couple of years ago, I, went, you know, I, I thought golf carts were silly. <laughs> and I have relatives that live in the, um, uh, uh, the villages, 
and they they have quite a bit of rules about their golf carts that they just don't enforce them. And it's the same thing with Vieira. I heard just some of the people talking about Vieira. I mean, Vieira is supposed to be 16 years old, as far as I know. But again, they're just not enforcing it. Uh, they had a meeting at Suntree, uh, very similar to what yours, and they brought up some of the same uh, considerations. And uh, the, the you know the big issue was having licensed drivers only driving on the road, and, and also insured and with a license plate. And if you go, I went down to the motor vehicle department. Unless you got all that stuff on there, uh, you're not going to get a plate. I checked. So that's it. Thank you. Charlie Graham, uh, Satellite Beach resident. Um, I'm an economist. My degree's in uh, economics. Um, I am the antithesis of a tree hugger. I am not a tree hugger. I am someone that believes that everyone has a value in ecology. It's a, it can be, uh, I had a great professor in, uh, at my university, Eric Erickson. He's now teaching out at the University of Denver. I contacted him a little bit ago because he inspired me to understand how someone can value a tree. And every one of us has values for the ecology and the environment. Um, golf carts, I think, are a wonderful tool that we have for the future. Um, so much, and my wife, if you will, is a, quote, tree hugger. Um, we have a pure electric focus vehicle. Um, does not use any gasoline. You just plug it in at night. We drive it every day. Um, I love it because it saves us money. It's actually much cheaper to operate. Um, from all this discussion, what I believe is really important is I'd like to have a responsible uh, child, 12, 13, 11, 10 years old, someone that is responsible, their parents are ultimately responsible for them, to be able to go from the west side of uh, South Patrick Drive to the beach in a vehicle, and call it what you want it. I'd like to see that vehicle have all the safety requirements, no matter where it's driving. So I think having those safety uh, items that are listed for a low-speed vehicle would make a 10, 11, 12-year-old driving a golf cart, it would make it safer. It would make it safer for everyone. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, I think for someone that is a senior citizen that no longer has a driver's license, I think it is the ultimate vehicle to allow them to get to Publix, to get to the doctor. Uh, my wife's grand, or my wife's mom had a jazzy cart. She was disabled. She had lost part of leg, and she had the flag on the back of the jazzy cart. She actually lived in Indian Harbor Beach, and she would go to Publix in Indian Harbor Beach, and that was such a challenge. Um, that all being said, I don't think there's absolutely any reason for an ordinance because all that's going to do is create stuff we don't want. It's going to create expense for the city that we don't need. It has no benefit to our city of Satellite Beach. It, I think it would be totally counterproductive in, in all those realms, in costs, in economy, in efficiency, in, 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 in helping everyone. I think that's the wrong way. What I think would be the right way would be for the city to um, look into creating a couple crossovers from South Pat and to the beach that would comply with what the intent of the DOT would have in order to, to cross those, those two particular items. That way, we don't have to have it certified, but if we have that available for someone on either side and it gives discretion to the chief, if anything is not correct, we have both. That way, there's no argument that you can go from the west side of the city to the beach and we all know that person is going to be safe. We have no regulations. We have nothing added. So there's, I, I see no reason to have any other kind of an ordinance specifying. I think it is against our best interest. Thank you. It's three minutes, and I appreciate it. You spoke. Um, Jerry, you, you had your hand up, too, were you? Please. Jerry, that's the um, The ordinance that was 
made the motion. If my reading of it, and I could be wrong, may be wrong, is that you still need permission of DOT to cross South Patrick for A1A. Not if we're doing – the motion was to approve Florida statute. I understand that. Florida statute allows, if it's a low-speed vehicle, it allows it to cross A1A or South Patrick. All right. Thank you. Now, my question is this. There are quite a few streets – I don't know the exact number – on the west side of South Patrick that do not have cross streets on the other side. They T-bone into South Patrick. For them to leave – because this is – you know, if we pass this – and I think golf carts or low-speed vehicles is a good thing. But if we pass this, there are going to be people who are living on certain areas – I think Waterway Estates is – not Waterway Estates. The fountains, where there is no exact cross street over. You have to drive a little bit on South Patrick or quite a lot of it on South Patrick to cross over South Patrick. And if we did that, then the DOT would have to get permission for even low-speed vehicles because South Patrick is a 40-mile-per-hour road and A1A, which is a 45-mile-per-hour road, to drive on those streets. Yes, sir. Okay. I know what you're saying there by the angle. Thank you, Jerry. Dave Fine, citizen. Many years ago, I was at that meeting when this issue first came up by golf carts. The reason this issue originally came up was we had a gentleman with cerebral palsy who was restricted from driving. And I can't recall if it was a low-speed vehicle or a golf cart. But he was restricted from driving in Satellite Beach with his golf cart. Of course, this greatly diminished his quality of life because he had no other transportation other than his wife driving him around. So that's the original – that was the original intent of bringing this to the forefront, to counsel's attention. I am not in favor of having 14-year-olds driving the golf carts all over the place in Satellite Beach. They will do foolish things like most 14-year-olds will. And I don't – I think that the low-speed vehicle would, in fact, give anybody with any type of a physical hindrance to be able to travel in Satellite Beach. But I am not in favor of golf carts in Satellite Beach. I think the low-speed vehicles would meet the requirements to help everybody out with their quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment still open. Here, and now I'll bring it back to counsel. Question. Why do we even have to have this when it's a state statute? And so right now, if we don't do anything, they're still allowed to – And that doesn't change. I'm just trying to put this to bed by stating this is our policy, that golf carts in this city will be governed by the Florida statute. Okay. You know, what's interesting to me, I – the daytime thing, I'm not trying to agree with you with 10- and 12-year-old kids. I mean, I've seen them in the Bahamas and getting wrecks and stuff, so I'm kind of wary there. The other thing is, Jerry said, is fountains in certain areas, the streets there don't line up. And that would just be the way it would have to be. They wouldn't be allowed to cross in that situation. But to pick out – wait a second, I'm talking. Thank you. When you pick out a neighborhood and say you're allowed to do it here, but you're not allowed to do it over here, I don't like that. I mean, I think if we're going to do it, it needs to be for the city so everybody can do it if they want a golf cart. And right now, with the knowledge that we have on it here, if we do nothing and just stick with what the state says, we can come back and do more research and study on it. And people right now can still use the carts right now. And what I look at, it's all these things are safety things that normally you would want to do. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. So can you clarify 
If I'm coming out of the fountains on Fountain Boulevard and I want to cross South Patrick Drive with a low speed vehicle that is properly meeting Florida statute, I can cross that road. With a low speed vehicle, you can cross that road. I can cross A1A also. Yes. Anyway. Thank you. But, but you just have wait, wait, to have wait. another road to get to. What, Ms. But you. But if you look up, what he's saying is we're not T, we're not square there. Right. If you come out of the fountains, you have used the term the old minute saver right there. In order for you to get to, I think it's not sure what that comes out there. Would it right. You have to drive a little bit down South Patrick. You're, you're navigating. You're not driving down South Patrick. You're doing this. Well, you're doing it us. What he's saying is it's not a direct crossover. Right. Right. You'd have to drive a little but bit down is, the road. But it is technically, would you consider that a, a cross going from Fountain Boulevard to Sherwood? I mean, you're driving the, across the, the street. Let's put it this way. The state law doesn't say that crossing has to be exactly east to west. A cross can be from here to here, from here to here. I. I Without looking at it, thinking about it, seeing it happen and, and all that, I would have to say that there's crossing is different than driving down the street. And clearly, if someone's driving down South Patrick Drive, that's a problem. If they're crossing it, then I, you know, I don't see that that's a problem. Now, that's just an off the cuff based on what you're saying. And I see the point. What I'd rather see is the person cross and use the sidewalk if they have to for that 30 or 50 feet, that's safer than being on the, the street. But again, that's, we'll just have to wait and see what the situation is. And, you know, the, the bottom line is if people are doing the right thing and they're trying and they're being safe and they're trying to, you know, operate it, they're trying to get from point A to point B. I mean. If I could just comment real quick. The staff is recommending to, to go with the state statute, um, largely not only from a standpoint of, you know, we from cost that we would have to do the study and put the signs on all that, but also from a safety standpoint because, you know, our community was not built for, for golf carts, um, although they, it may be an acceptable residential community for that, and it sounds like, you know, people want to use golf carts. The low-speed vehicle, the, the, the difference between that and a golf cart that can be operated at night is so minimal to us that we feel that we should stay with that. And the reason why, lar largely, too, is we have – concerns. Last night I gave you an article, it was in the Florida Today this morning, about a woman who was hit in her golf cart crossing Murrell um, in Rockledge and she was airlifted. You know, she was hit by a car. So um, we're concerned with any ordinance that would enable this, um, that we would have a liability there. And if we stay with the state statute and, and just let the citizens know, our community know that they have that ability and put it in the beach caster and, and allow them, you know, answer their questions and help them get through the state statutes, we think that's a better option for us in terms of a liability and just trying it out before we go down the path of a full-blown ordinance for a golf cart. I think that's great. Yeah, I, I'm going to say, I think, and again, let me go back to, do we really need to vote on this? We just, right now, if we do nothing, Everybody can do what we're saying here. We are establishing a policy so that this doesn't keep coming up again and again. This needs to be put to bed if we think that the Florida statute uh, solves the, addresses the issues, which I personally do, because with this uh, low-speed vehicle uh, statute, um, folks have the ability to, to uh, drive their golf carts throughout the city, and uh, nothing is served. Uh, but things are complicated by the city passing ordinances to adopt um, separate provisions for golf cart use of the city. Well, my thing, I, I know this could come back to us at any time. There could be more information that we find once this people know you can have golf carts. And we might learn from it and be able to tweak it. We've tweaked everything else over time here. So it's just Mark, 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 Mark has a motion question. In a I, I, that's fine. And I'm going to ask this question of Mr. Beadle. Jim, do we really need to do anything? Everything's in place. Does this council need to really do anything as a policy, or is it already there? We just move on. Is that – tell me there's a reason why we need to do what's the motions on the table, because I can't see it at this point. Well, the issue is just a policy decision as to whether or not you want to make a statement based on what the motion is. I mean, that's what it boils down to, is whether council wants to make – take that position. 
So basically, we would be taking a position with, that we support the state statute. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Without further modification at this time. Does that help the police department if we do that? Or does that, is it a mute point? No, because the only, the, only the, on, the only issue is, is that if you go the other route, you have to, you have to adopt the ordinance. Or create an ordinance. Or create an ordinance, yeah. But by us creating a policy doesn't put any teeth in it one way or the other. It's just kind of like that's our opinion no. for today. No. Okay. You're just saying we're going to go with what the state statute says right now. Okay. But it's basically a, it's an opinion that this council Correct. has. Or, or, okay. Other questions? Yeah. No, I just have some comments. Um, you said that the, the law recently changed, what, seven months ago? I no, I, we we found it seven months ago. I don't I don't know if it changed prior to that. We just didn't know about so it. So we keep saying we're beating this dead horse, but laws constantly change. So he, you know, there's a, obviously a, I don't know when the law changed, but they made a clear, clear distinction between a golf cart and a low speed. So I don't think it's beating a dead horse to bring things back to the council for reconsideration when laws change constantly. Um, you have children, or uh, I say children, because you know, uh, kids now with permits at 15. Driver's license at 16. I would rather find an avenue for them to drive in a golf cart to school than to be in a vehicle riding all over the place. I think that's a lot safer than driving in vehicles. Um, as far as the cost, I really would have preferred to see a cost, cost differential. When you're talking about a golf cart that goes under, under 20 miles an hour, the cost for that, and then a vehicle that goes over 20 miles an hour plus all the other stuff, there's a big difference. It's kind of like getting a V6 and a V8. So I would have really had liked to have seen a, a real cost differential before you just say it's $500 because I know I know it's not to go from street legal to a golf cart. Again, it shows lack of progressiveness, and um, I really would have liked to have seen a little more consideration because it's something the community wants. It's something that's been on my radar for three years, and it never was discussed. This is the ordinance from Brevard County. It's not really a big deal. It limits limits golf carts. Um, in certain areas of Brevard County. And with respect to this woman, do you know if she was hit at a designated cross area? I have no idea. We don't know. Yeah, so, the article just says that she was she was <coughs> in critical condition after a golf cart was hit by a car while she was driving across a road on Tuesday evening. Right. So, so right here in, this, in Brevard County's road. code, and I'm not being argumentative, but a lot of stuff is thrown in here that kind of spins things in a direct, different direction. Mural should not be a designated road street except for, for golf carts except that railroad may be crossed only at a designated pedestrian, at designated pedestrian crossings. We don't know if she was doing that or not. So, um, anyway, that's well, what I'm going to say. Mr. Mayor, my I, have question. I, I have a question. No, excuse me, I'm going to answer one thing. So this, what we're doing, doesn't preclude you continuing bringing to us what it does cost to convert. One gentleman said he went and did it, it was 500 so you can bring that information any time to council here, and we can relook at it. All we're saying tonight is that we're going to back right now with the knowledge that we have, and the chief has said this is what he would recommend, the Florida State statute. You can, we can bring it. You can open it up at any time. I wouldn't waste my time. Okay, well, that's your <laughs> priority. That's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just yes. for the record, my purpose was to educate the council on the difference between the two laws, not, not to research price differences on upgrades to golf carts. Uh, so that's why that information wasn't provided. I didn't say that anything was $500 or not. I, someone, the audience said it, and I was told several times that that was roughly the numbers they got. But I didn't do that research. That wasn't part of it. So uh, that's why that information is not provided. It's not because... I didn't Mr. Uh, Mayor, now I have a point of order. I called the question that the chair needs to deal with it. Well, I'm going to deal with it I'm after everybody's answer. Everybody, any That's further not in comment? accordance with Robert's rules. Further? Okay. Lenore? Okay. Yes. I, I don't really have a choice. Yes, we have to abide by the state law. But. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item nine, discuss, take action on purchase of assisting hearing device and upgrade to existing sound system in the council chambers. Uh, is Andy is uh, please. Um, thank you, Mayor. The um, we've had some complaints regarding our sound system. 
um, from community members and as well as council. And uh, we have basically looked into upgrading the system to provide um, a system <coughs> listening system. Um, and we'll allow Andy and Adam to fill in on that. But we've provided a quote for you. Uh, we would like to get your approval to move forward with that um, quote and budget amendment this evening. Okay. Thank you. Andy? Hey, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the uh, council. As, as the city manager said, uh, basically this is a, a cost quote from uh, BIS Digital. There are current audio providers here. We, we have a yearly contract with them uh, for the maintenance and upkeep of the current audio system in, in the uh, council chamber. So it made sense to go to them and get a quote for what we were looking for. Basically, the assistant hearing devices um, <clears throat> are outdated. So we would look to upgrade those. That was the major cost of the $8,000 in these fees. Um, there's a, a list of things here uh, for better gooseneck microphones that actually come to the person's uh, mouth so you can hear them better. They're not so far away. Some podium upgrades, um, three microphone stands, an audio mixer device, uh, the installation and training of everything, and then the annual uh, service and support. Um, they were also um, have been here to actually on site. Uh, Council Member Gott was here um, to kind of go over what our issues we were having with the, with the current system, and they've sort of been the ones to recommend uh, these upgrades. There's a price breakdown of the um, of the expenses uh, that you can see that you've been provided with, and, and really, um, not the BIS is the only provider. However, it does make sense. We'd have to. Um, in order to have two different companies here to uh, maintain the system, this company already has the knowledge of what we have currently and is recommending these upgrades. Um, Adam, our, our IT um, manager is here if you have any questions on the technicalities of the proposal, but uh, it's basically to provide a better assisted hearing device and then also provide um, some better quality um, audio in the council chambers. Thank you. Um, questions from council? I make a motion to approve the expenditure of $8,025 from the Capital Assets Fund for the BIS Digital's audio system upgrades in the Council Chamber. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Gott. Second. Second by Councilman Montanero. Um, discussion. Uh, okay, Mark. Um, Adam or, or, yeah, I'll just go with Adam. What happens with the old equipment? I mean, are we, where does uh, it go? Do we get any? credit for that or anything? No, that. unfortunately. There's really no old equipment. The, well, the old assisted devices are just so old. We're not going to get any credit okay. for those. We'll be replacing these microphones, but I guess we'll be keeping them as, as uh, emergency backups. I remember when we bought all this stuff, when we, so we had the recording device that Lenore is, is, is using. Uh, that was a up, big upgrade at that point. Um, is that going to impact her system that she's got now in any no, way? It, it, should, it should intermix fine? Correct, yes. Okay. Since it's the same company that set it, set it up, they're going to make sure that everything works. Okay. The way That's it all right, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Questions? No, I mean, I know this has been an issue. Gabe, I just gave still here. It's been an issue. Several months ago, I attended a uh, the retirement board meeting, and none of the headphones worked. So thanks now that I'm leaving, because I'm deaf in one year, three years later, for getting, upgrading everything. I don't, no, I'm not going to be here, but I appreciate it, and it should have been done a long time ago. Question. The headphones, if I may use that term, that a person in the audience would use, how many of those are we getting? We are getting four devices. Okay, so the quantity four here actually, on the second line item. Actually, I believe, I believe it's five devices. Okay. And we felt that that was needed because as the as the citizens get older, we'll probably have more people coming in with hearing issues. Okay, so it's, I didn't see it in here. That's the reason I was asking that. I see, you know, Unipoint, Gooseneck, Mike, Long, four of those. Yeah. I just want to make sure that. Yeah, I, I looked at that too. It says, you know, under, so, on the first page it says, upgraded assistant listening system includes four infrared receivers with headphones. Okay, that's but the then one. On, you know, when it listed on the back, it just lists it as one assisted yeah. listening system. Okay. So we are getting four. Correct. Right. Okay. okay. Further questions from council? Okay. At this time, open it up agenda item nine for public comment. Just real quick, Charlie Graham, Satellite Beach, IT question. 
Um, the system you're purchasing, can you increase the number of headsets and is there a limit that you see that we're not going to exceed? My point is you're buying five headsets, can you add six, seven, eight? Is there a point that you know of? I mean, if it's 100, you're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. Can it go to like seven, eight, nine, ten? Do you know? I, I would have to, to check with the eyes. Thank you. That's a good question. For the public, Steve. Steve Hedley, President. I actually spent some time talking to Adam today about this, and, and he was gracious and everything. The answer to the previous gentleman's question is yes. Um, you can increase them. There's no limit because it works off an IR, um, an IR since there's no overload back to the system. But anyway, I can't. I understand why we're upgrading. But when I look at this bid, and unfortunately, through no fault of his own, Adam is not a sound guy. That's the first thing he told me today. He's not a sound guy. I ran sound for churches, concerts, believe it or not, rock bands for 12 years. So I have a somewhat understanding of what's going on. The engineers for, for BIS are specifying a mixing board with an amp, 60 watt amp, which is 30 RMS. But the problem is that's an amp that's designed to go directly to a speaker. <coughs> that's what it's designed to do. An amp, even with phantom power, which was, and their engineers, according to Adam, their engineers' question is, deals with being able to make the run from the microphone back to your amplifier in the back closet. That's the real concern. Phantom power will do that with no problem because you're dealing with very, very small, very, very small wattages in transfer from a microphone. That's why you can, you grab them, they don't shock you, even if you're wet. You're dealing with small. So I'm, I'm confused as why we need a, a huge monster, 800 and some odd, um, some odd mixing board and an amplifier, when the same thing can be done with a better quality piece of equipment for $150. <coughs> I understand the point that we want to go with the same company and that they're familiar with us. I would understand that, except they're charging us to be familiar with this. In this contract, we are paying them more to come up and maintain the system that they're already maintaining. What are we getting out of this? It's six hours of driving time to get here. Are we really saying that there's nobody in Brevard County that can do this? That we're paying $1,900 for three hours work of installation? That makes no sense to me. This bid cries out for a competitive bid from someone else in the county to see what's going on. Last year or two years ago, we had a thing on local vendors, and here we are going to Fort Lauderdale to get this done. This thing cries out to have a second competitive bid. Thank you. Floor is still open. Jerry Hudson, resident. Um, piggybacking on what uh, Mr. Headley said, um, if we put this out for competitive bids, part of the bidding process for a company non-BIS who is quote unquote not familiar with the system and is, I guess we're paying them currently under contract to support our system as it is right now. It would be for them to support the system and see what that comes back to, do cost-benefit analysis. The other thing, um, on um, the wireless system, now I don't know specifically what brand they're using, but um, 
you know, this is their designated code numbers, BIS, whatever. But the 7518, I did a search for assisted listening system, um, 7518. And I came back with a system that is infrared, has four units, and costs $1,907. And that was the, one of the higher prices. And BIS wants to charge us $3,000. That's why I think we should get competitive bidding on this on these things. Um, I no expert. I think the rest of the microphone system seems to me working fine. Seems to me that the problem is just the assistive lis listening system. But if we were to get new microphones, um, I copied off a page from a Google search under gooseneck microphones. XLR connection on off switches and came up there's a huge price range anywhere from $28 up to $179 so I think even we could get these microphones for a lot less quality microphones for a lot less thank you we're still open David Schechter, 635 Civil Court. Don't split this thing with two, two different people. I've worked with systems where you have half your system belongs to somebody who is responsible for it, the other half, and they sit there and point at each other where the problem is. If you're going to go out and do it, do the whole system. Don't do half of it. You, I think the same company needs to do the whole thing. So I, I'm not saying you don't need to rebid it, but if you're going to do it, you do the whole system so it comes in one, one contractor and one person responsible for maintaining it. It's a mess. I had it with computers where you had somebody responsible for half the system, somebody responsible for the other half, and you get a problem, and they just point their fingers at each other. You don't get any going. So don't split this thing between two different people. Either go with the same people, or if you rebid it, do the whole thing. Don't just rebid a piece of it. Thank you. Floor still open? There are none. Jake Blanken wanted to identify that he was for a uh, ABA hearing and following microphone system um, improvements. He had an issue with the cost, but he was still uh, proactively um, okay. Thank you. Uh, who was that? Hey. Hey. I'll close the public comment back to council. Um, did we not look at others because the system that we have now is there a system? Yes. And by going with another company, they, well, we would have two companies supporting the system. And if we had issues, I'm sure they would be, there would be difficulty in identifying which company is responsible for which part of the system. Did it may they, also break our uh, annual maintenance contract with BIS Digital to bring in another company with other equipment that they don't support. It, will it, it may. It may okay. very well. I'd have to look through the maintenance agreement. Did they come in here into the chambers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I wasn't here, and everything is compatible. The systems work, and yeah, we we discussed it at length. Those all the different options we had. We all we had uh, different ideas about what we could do, and they told us the pros and cons. So <coughs> the system that uh, the court that they gave us was the one that we jointly decided was the best solution, uh, given the problems we were having. Okay, and I have. A couple of people have come up to me after meetings and said that they don't have hearing problems, but they can't hear what's being said in this room unless people are speaking directly into microphones. And the gentleman who did come out here and check to see what we need, he identified what he called uh, dead spots uh, in multiple places around the room, which apparently will be resolved uh, by this new system. So everybody should be able to hear better what's going on in these meetings. Further comments? Okay. Just a question, because when I attended the, uh, I think it was the uh, retirement board meeting and, the, and I was trying to wear the headset and it didn't work, we had talked afterwards and you said it was four grand for the, about four grand for the headset. So now all of a sudden, when did we decide to go with a whole new system? It's not a whole new system, but we're just. Well, I mean, headsets and then microphones and how did that come about? Just curious. Well, because we were identifying all the different issues that people were having. Okay. And. And it partly was the assisted listening devices that we currently have, which are outdated, what? and partly the microphones, uh, the microphone issues. 
ask a question. When was the last time this system was, and, and not Lenore's portion of it, but the speaker system, the listening system, how old is it? Do you have any idea? I, I don't know. That BIS Digital came in in 2007 to do the software mm -hmm. for the computer. Right. And the. Uh, well, how about the rest of the. I would imagine when, when the uh, building was built. Yeah, because when we did that system, it was just the microphones and her system. We didn't touch anything in the ceiling ones. I don't think it didn't go any further. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and that would have been 1991 or two that this, yeah. we opened this. Yeah. I, I do think the gentleman, gentleman make good points that, you know, it is our responsibility to procure services at the lowest cost on behalf of the taxpayer. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's a bad idea, even if we split the system up to get quotes to have in the file. Not actually, you don't have to go out to bid, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to get quotes. So you're saying get quotes from another provider that would be a different system. It would be their system trying to make it compatible with this? Yeah, I mean, that's it's just that's a good the, idea. That's to, the yeah. point because there's, we would not bid this out. This would be an RFP yeah. because there's, you know, there's a hundred ways to do this. So we, and we're not, we're not, we can't. We don't have the expertise to write the specs for something like this. So what we would do is put out an RFP and people would come and look at the system and then submit a proposal of how they would do it. So it would be an RFP process. It wouldn't be a bid. It, we would prefer to stay with the, the group that we have now, like because like uh, Mayor Schechter said, that when you have two different systems, it, it causes us problems from a maintenance standpoint. Um, so if we were ever to go out and, and redo the whole system, that, of course, we would RFP. In this case, we're just adding and, and upgrading a current system, so we would stay with the current group that we have. Okay. okay. Got a motion on a second? Yeah. Any further discussion? You are none, Lenore? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Um, question: When will they start this process, and how long does it take? Uh, they did not give us a, a date, but they're uh, they're relatively fast when they when we've had issues. Um, and since it's not going to, they're not going to have to do. If they do any wiring, they are responsible for wiring and cabling. Um, and I make sure it works in the yes. training and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 10, uh, agendas for, um, thank you, uh, agenda for next uh, October 15th meeting. Um, Mayor, we, we're going to have the medical marijuana ordinance on this agenda, um, and we will likely have more items as the, couple, the weeks go on, but um, it, it probably will be a, somewhat of a light agenda on okay. the 15th. Okay. And again, if someone wants to need something added to it, please see myself or Courtney on this. Thank you. Um, moving on to agenda item 11, appointments to boards. Um, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we appoint Kenneth Farson as a regular member of the Board Adjustment David Vigliotti is a regular member of the Samson's Island Park Committee, and Charles Graham is an alternate, alternate member of the Recreation Board. Motion by Vice Mayor Second. Gott, second by Councilman Brimer. Any further discussion from Council? And the reason that I um, picked uh, Mr. Farson instead of Mrs. McClendon was because um, Mr. Farson has an excellent re um, attendance record, okay. and so I, I felt he should move up. Okay. Normally, I'm just going to ask this question. Normally, when we do it, we do it individually. Does anybody have a problem with it no. grouped together? Okay, thank you. Um, Lenore? Yes. 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 Yes, motion carries. Thank you. And, and Mr. Mayor, uh, I just want to um, mention that Christine Hendricks um, has had to resign from the Board of Adjustment uh, due to health concerns. And uh, I just hope that the city, the mayor, sends her a letter thanking her for her service. Christine has been a volunteer with the city for many years, and um, she's always been there for us, and we're going to miss her uh, service on the board. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, thank you. Um, and also, I think we need to somehow maybe in the next beach caster, Courtney, maybe recognize. recognize her and also recognize her. And also, we need to get more people to sign up for these other boards like positions. An article on boards and yeah. opening boards. I mean, I, that, that's helped us in the past to draw people. So. I can send it through Facebook, too. Great. Thank you. Um, going on to agenda item 12 uh, minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the special meeting on September 17th and a motion for the regular meeting on September 17th as submitted. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Vice Mayor Gott. Discussion on the minutes. Hearing none, Lenore? Councilman Brown? Yes. Councilman Yes. 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 Motion carries. Any new business before council? Hearing none. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, staff. Thanks, Mark.